Uh, okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, first of all, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are still on last night, good evening. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who uh, you know, couldn't make it, hello. Um, so my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a senior UX architect uh, working in The Guardian. Uh, I specifically work in uh, what's called the digital development team, where we're looking at sort of the future of telling news on the web, uh, apps, whatever new technology. Uh, this talk mostly consists of football, which is why I am not surprised the room is roughly full of guys. Um, but it's mostly going to be talking about the team that we actually put together before we launched the site to make the football experience the best it could possibly be. So there'll be some insights, um, we shared some interesting stories, um, how we built that team up, and how we uh, made the stuff we did. Uh, just a little bit about me. There's my spot the guy who didn't make a full free presentation. Uh, Twin handle is uh, Mr. Underscore Mister. Nothing to do with an American musician, just accident. Um, I work on the mobile app team at The Guardian. <coughs> Uh, I've done so for about six, seven months. And that's basically looking at sort of the future of where we think sort of loyalty is going to go. Um, if any of you use the apps right now and you have any genuine like gripes or anything about it, I'm actually quite happy to listen to them afterwards. It's quite interesting to see firsthand what people think about the app and so on. Um, and other most notably, I just want to say this out loud. Um, I designed, I was responsible for the design of the mobile um, web experience of the Apple Analysis. Uh, just put my hands up, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, as I said uh, just a couple of uh, minutes ago, this is about building a winning team. So, this was a team that operated from January to April 2014, and this was way before the launch of what we call internally the next gen web. Site. So I'm going to talk around how in three to four months uh, we worked insanely hard, we worked insanely fast, uh, we made a lot of little nice features, uh, we broke a lot of nice little features, and we learned a lot about those little features. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, setup, how we actually put the team together, and what kind of goals we set for ourselves. Uh, I'm going to talk around how we actually design things. So I really want to get into a crux of something I think is really important around agile design. Um, I'm going to talk also about the awesome team themselves. Uh, because we were a very small unit that operated within a very big unit. So there was around, at the time, 130 people that worked in the um, And there were six of us that worked in the board. We were all cross-functional. And we were also trying to get this big, ambitious goal around the garden and trying to enact change but keeping sort of in line with the garden values, you know. We're a journalistic company first, but we're also a product. So how do we keep eyeballs and page and make money that don't, you know, get in the way of that type of vision we've got? So it's an interesting balance to challenge. So this is the six of us, minus the badly cut heads and the green bodies. Uh, I am very aware that it was all guys. And that had nothing to do with the fact that we were football fans. Only actually three of us were football fans. The rest were just interested to work on an interesting small global project. But uh, I'm going to go into more detail on that later on. So what did we actually produce? Well, we didn't actually produce, in retrospect, we didn't actually felt that we produced an awful lot of stuff. But what we were aiming to do in the end um, was to create elements that enhance our sort of football offerings on the garden itself. So it was things like data being added to the article pages uh, through scores, through stats. Um, we merged a lot of our match pages into a single URL for our match page experience. Um, and we had data pages in their own rights, so tables, pictures, and so on. And the last thing we did, which I think was the most interesting, was we created a tool for an editorial team to actually decide where the data would go on certain pages. So we actually gave them the choice of where these things would go. So when I talk about elements, what I actually mean is this. So things like the, uh, the two tabs that would be our match page experience, so people could find other related article pages and scores. 
Um, simple things like the badges, the team day, the school day, the school day. Seems like simple things, right? But it was really interesting and really good to sort of get that out of people's heads and get it off the page. <coughs> and, uh, and that would extend further down the page where we would have more stats. So stats on uh, the actual match itself, possession, goal attempts, corners, flags, so on. Uh, we would then have any other match sets. Apologies for the quality there. This is, say, a live score match. We would have tables. Basically, a lot, a lot of data. So what was so good about this team? Well, we released partial features every two to three days. So due to the set of the football, and the fact that we were in beta, mostly, um, we could release really often and really early. Sometimes a lot of mistakes, but with limited risk. Um, we had little to no meetings, um, due to the fact that we were co-located and there was only six of us. Uh, we could have chats at our desks or around a whiteboard or in a little committee more room that we set up for ourselves. So our conversations were constant. We were never having to go anywhere to have a meeting. Um, and we set a precedent for other teams. So we set up this sort of mentality of bigger uh, teams, say the apps team, which has um, something between 30 and 40 uh, people, taking a small group of five to six people going away, doing design spikes, that kind of whiteboard, war room concept, to sort of really spread through the digital development uh, department. Um, we operated uh, as a team in the first four months of the year. Uh, most crucially, generally, uh, we did actually have a strict deadline. Um, but what we did almost immediately within the first week was we set ourselves uh, week deadlines. So at the end of every week, on a Friday, at 5.30, Shock horror. We were doing Friday 5.30 releases. Um, and the reason, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> the reason we were doing that was because Saturday, obviously that's Monday to Friday, uh, Saturday was our most important day of the week. That's when we were going to learn the most about our football scores. Everybody was coming to the Guardian for the Premier League. You know, even though we want to show a balanced view across everything else, people are coming to the Premier League. Premier League mostly happens the weekend. We need to learn and know what's going on. So realistically, our job was seven days a week. But on Saturday and Sunday, we'd be learning as much as we could. So we took one for the team. Sorry, I'm going to not try and say it in puns, like team, goal, all that kind of stuff. But if it comes out, I apologize. Um, so how many users were actually seeing our stuff at the time? Well, interestingly, within The Guardian, the most important number to everyone within editorial was our desktop number. And only 5% of our desktop traffic, desktop and tablet traffic, sorry we're seeing uh, our feed changes. But 100% we're seeing our mobile changes. And what was interesting at the time was that we were getting very close to 50% of all of our traffic covered by mobile. So there was, we knew there was gonna be this big shift, this big mental shift internally about all the editorial, you know, the editor in chief, everyone start to sort of refocus their, their um, efforts into mobile first. But we needed to sort of keep the train going, even if people weren't really uh, following us, following with us. Uh, football itself was the second most viewed uh, piece on The Guardian, and it was first on mobile. We had a World Cup coming up, and this is an example of a really sort of patched together page uh, at the table. Um, and this existed in the beta site that we had, but it was very much mashed together just for a first release on mobile so people could see what was going on. And the second uh, most interesting piece of sort of um, backlog that we had was we had all of our content sort of copied over from the existing site onto the new site as well. So we had all the content to play with from the existing sites. So it was a nice sort of balance and a good sort of uh, foundation to play with. <clears throat> and finally for setup, uh, we had uh, a week before we had two days of a hack day where some, not all, of the football team got together and we started to sort of play around in the batch page just to see what the stats could offer us uh, from our third party provider. And this was a nice sort of bonding experience for the team, see what, you know, where people are, what kind of skill sets they had. So, in my opinion, I think that there are three components, three components uh, that contribute to our winning team. It might contribute to lots of winning teams. <coughs> Um, some of this might be really obvious, hopefully some of it's quite interesting. Um, the first one, I think, is prep. 
Does everybody know the six P's? I got told that school. <coughs> the army thing. The perfect preparation prevents such poor performance. <laughs> um, but what I actually, in retrospect of writing this, what I actually mean there is it's not about preparation, it's about having good communication and a good understanding of what's important. So having good preparation when we were both around Rudless, and that we would do a good amount of prep to achieve a common goal. Here I go again with funds. Um, the second one is uh, this kind of idea of agile design. So doing enough iteration and uh, incrementation. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I think those two things overlap. And the third one is the team itself. So having this sort of continuous delivery and learning, um, being autonomous, ego-free, knowledgeable in the area, no matter what it is. It doesn't have to be football. And I think these three components lead to a really focused team and a really quick team. And I'm going to go into each one in detail right now. <laughs> okay, so prep. So I'm assuming everyone in here, or most people in here, are football fans. No. No? You're not a football fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're bad at the football club. <laughs> um, what I've learned from talking about football as a job is that everybody wants to talk about football. The problem is, is that everyone wants to talk about their team and their team first. And then what they might want to do is they might want to talk about what's wrong with your team. <coughs> well, what's wrong, you know, with the league that your team is in? Or maybe you've got the wrong manager, or maybe you made the wrong sign. Um, and so football brings a lot of opinions to the table. Now imagine that football is work. Well, football is your job, and you bring all of those opinions to the table, but then you also bring all the opinions of the work, and you start to bring an opinion around, or have discussions around what opinions are really important. And then you start just going, well, what things should we start doing? And we could have done a ton of stuff at the company, and we wanted to do a ton of stuff, but so did half the company. Um, and we were never going to get there without some sort of shared understanding. So we all needed to collectively understand what was important together. We couldn't have someone just come in and say, no, actually, this thing's the most important thing. We had to agree together what we thought was the most important thing. So we wanted to have momentum. We wanted to have understanding. So to get there, we needed prep. So January 21st, 2014, that was the very first day that we started work on the football project. And the very first day, we had a kickoff workshop. And it involved all six of us. And the two heads of editorial sport, so one from the paper and one from the website, and a various cacophony of people who said they needed to be there. So people from marketing, people from commercial, that you know they were just they wanted to be in a room and talk about football for a job. Who wouldn't? And this was the very first day. This is in our uh, UX studio, and everyone in the team that team that was set up for that day was involved in everything we were doing. And what I mean is they weren't just in the room. They were picking up post-its, they were writing stuff down, they were drawing, everybody was talking. We wanted to get as much conversation as going, as, as going as we could. And we were using various workshop techniques to sort of get that kind of stuff out. Things like five wise, having individual interviews and then group interviews. <coughs> and the idea is we wanted to get as much out of everyone's heads as we possibly could. So we worked up everything from page features, so we got everyone to draw their ideal 3 p.m. Saturday afternoon kickoff. Uh, we looked at common journeys that users would normally take. We did um, templates, so new and old, and anything for the World Cup, which is a bit hidden there. But you know, we had this wealth of experience with the Guardian, and we wanted to get all of that stuff out of their heads. But we wanted them to talk to developers and talk to designers and see what we could, could be done and what was really going to be really interesting. So that was day one. Day two was a, uh, essentially, I'd probably call it a two-week sprint, um, but none of us actually built anything. We all went away, we looked in little groups at different things. So myself and the designer, we went away and looked at what could be visually possible. So we sketched out full-page designs, elements, new ideas, anything we thought we might want to be able to do, that's what we tried to do. Um, 
The other thing that we did as the design team was we set up uh, foam boards, two sort of A0 boards that we could pin stuff to and move them around the desk where we were so people could come by and see exactly what we were doing. We wanted to be really open and really sharing with everyone without having to do anything to our vision through. At the same time, we uh, brought in a researcher who ran a diary study, and that was for a week with 10 people. That was to best understand what was important to users about football. When were they looking at football? What devices were they looking at? How often and when? And finally, our developers looked into our press association data. So that's where we're getting our third party data from. And that was all basically, yeah, it's all fine coming up with these great ideas and these needs. It wasn't actually possible with the data. And then through those two weeks, the three of us were actually just conversing and saying, this is what we would love to do. What can we actually do? What do people want? So what did we learn in those two weeks? Everybody with a newspaper site or if they sell does data. But as far as I can tell, everyone does data the same way. So we have a column down the right hand side. You can just see the bits of data. You can read the article and then you can skim across what you need to do. There's a bit of discourse there or disconnect between the connection of data to the stories themselves. We were wondering or hypothesizing, could you enhance the page with the data rather than just it being a focus or sort of tap onto the site? So we were thinking about ways we could give it personality. So the first insight we had was an intelligent use of data, so sort of bringing depth to our data. So don't just stick static stuff on the page, make it part of the content. Take the data further. You know, make it a useful addition to the page. Like, for example, when's a key moment for an editor to like choose when the data goes in? Well, why don't we make a tool that lets them decide where it goes? Well, we don't have to do anything. They write a nice piece of content and they drop in a nice piece of data when they think it works. It doesn't have to be a player, it could be a fixture, it could be a table, it could be talking about a team. Data was the number one, you know, it's obviously the number one need from the diary study. They want to see scores, they want to see stats, but in what order and what preference. And we wanted to try and offer something that other establishments weren't. We kind of wanted to break the mold a bit, you know. We are the guy that we know for. <laughs> Uh, the second, and this is something I think we were very aware of um, at The Guardian, was liveness. We were dog slow when it came to producing our stuff. We were very much a long read, you know, weekend, take your time. Football's not. Football's like the opposite end. It's like, I need a nap, I need to score, I need to know who scored, I need to know everything. And one thing we learned from talking to people was that speed is a matter of perspective. It's not just about how quick the page loads, it's how quickly I can find the content. So we knew that we were going to be quicker at loading our stuff, but maybe we could be a bit quicker, quicker in our consistency. It was going to be a responsive website. Maybe we could set some rules in place to make sure that everything would sit in the same place. Football's a fairly predictable thing, right? It always happens at the same time, almost the same days of the year. But once that match actually starts, it's really unpredictable. We don't know which matches are going to take off, which matches are not. The editors can choose which matches they uh, push up. But as long as people, when they come to those individual matches, can find the, um, the data really quickly and really consistently, consistently, maybe we can be perceived to be a bit quicker. And in that respect, we're sort of looking at this Friday to Monday experience that sort of a lot of newspapers are trying to get hold of that. Bring someone in right at the beginning of a match on the preview, keep them coming back for a live match, and then bring them back again at the end for a report, a sort of reflection. And so in that respect, we sort of, we went even beyond the, the Friday 5.30 releases and realized, you know, because of the regularity of football, maybe we can start to just release whenever the next match is on. And if, if it's right, if it's good enough, let's just put it out and learn. Remember, editorial think we're on 5%. We've got 100% of mobile to play with. But let's make sure we're doing something right so when they come and see it, it'll still look great. We started releasing the same amount. Uh, and finally, the third insight was surely pretty obvious, um, but football was going mobile. Everything was going mobile in these papers. And there we go. Um, the third insight was uh, go where the users are. So at the time, we were 50% of our traffic was on mobile, we're going to 50%. Now it's getting closer to like 65. You know, we're already over the threshold. And we recognize in, inside the Guardian that mobile is something that sh we should be taking really, really seriously. Um, 
At the time, though, we were already taking it seriously. So we wanted to make sure when people else outside Ditch Dev work, that we were ready for it. But one of the most interesting things um, was this is a very small screen. And as I was saying, we want to kind of enhance the editorial choices, that they, um, the editorial content. But we don't want to get in the way of it. But mobile being so small, it was going to be a really interesting challenge. And you know, as I said, 100% were seeing all of this stuff unless they opted out. Um, and it was a great opportunity for us to see what was going to be right. So, just to recap on the first, uh, first point, um, we covered all the bases. So everyone inside, inside the, the core team was involved from the get-go. Um, we gathered needs and we set goals for ourselves. So our goal in KPI was uh, time spent on page. And uh, the second one was engagement. And I'll get into the data right at the end. But, uh, the second point was we gathered needs, and that was not just internal, but external. Um, because it's really important to make sure that not only that the users see what we're trying to do, but from inside we see what the users actually want us to do. Sometimes it seems really obvious when they were giving us insights around which ones he matched at. But it's important for the editorial to see that. And uh, the third point, and most importantly, we had a shared understanding of the goals. So all of our thoughts were in the open, all of our designs were out there for everyone to see. You know, this, I'm trying to, trying to stress this wasn't so much planning, it's just sort of get everyone to make sure we were in front of us. And we all kind of knew what we wanted to aim at. Okay, number two. Agile design. Um, <coughs> practice, obviously, makes perfect. Um, we had some plans in our heads for this sort of perfect design moment. You know, as soon as we got a designer on the team, we're like, oh, we're going to make the best experience you could possibly imagine, right? And we were all going to make, you know, we were going to make sure our, our designs were going to look perfect, and we weren't going to be precious, right? Easy to say right at the beginning when we have when got designers on the team. Um, just to do a little uh, digress, this is, uh, I think this is a fantastic image. And I really miss the fact that free kick men don't have, like, uh, outfits anymore. You can really sort of guess what you think that was, when it was that hasn't guess. I got it totally wrong. I was about 15 when I was there. Oh, 97. Oh, well this was 97. I thought this was the 80s. Look at how short their shorts are. <laughs> <laughs> but now they're all sort of orange and red, faceless things. I miss, this is great. It's a shame. Anyway, sorry. I mean, this is a shame they don't look like that anymore. Anyway, um, so Kanban boards, right? To me, they feel very specific and they feel really, really empowering and great to developers. I'm not so convinced that they're so great for design. There's something that's sort of uh, loggerheads there into that process. Design often feels like it's, it's still sort of thrown over the fence or you're kind of crafting something before and then you'll tweak it as you go in. And we didn't want to do that in this process. We wanted to have a sort of ebb and flow between what new pieces and the technology of the data could provide and what the designers had in mind. Um, and we wanted room to experiment, you know. We wanted the design elements, we wanted to design elements while the devs were still building stuff, right? It sounds like a bit of an impossible thing to try. I did this, um, I'm sure you've all seen this before, this Jeff Patton, one of these uh, concept of the, the difference between incrementation and iteration Surely it's iteration, right, with design. We just we have a concept and we just let the devs build and we sort of dip in and out when we think it's necessary, right? We have this sort of goal in mind, we want to fail early and often, we want to make lots of changes to improve and build upon. I mean, our our you know editorial staff were already just, like worried about the fact that stuff was moving to mobile and you know things were already off hands. We we work in a print organization, and you're literally talking about shifting everything 100 miles an hour towards mobile, and then we're talking about, hey, we're just going to start not designing stuff, <coughs> and we're just going to put it out there. And they were, sh they were shit scared, like, this is, this is scary stuff. We're going from north to 100 miles an hour, so we kind of need to find the middle ground. We can't just go straight ahead and do all of it. Um, this is my, by the way, my own version of that. You know that, like, Spotify, draw skateboards, or... Uh, it's not a car, you build the bits up, you build like a scooter and then a skateboard. This is my version, so 
goalposts, five side pitch. Um, with incrementation, you could, uh, you've still got that sort of solid idea in your head, right? But maybe we can take the incrementation idea and we can sort of iterate up to points. So we can sort of split our elements or pages. And we can start to sort of design pieces up as we go. So, enough metaphors. In real terms, we would have our element on the left. And that element would probably sit on a page to turn one. And then maybe those elements would sit within articles as well. But what goes in those elements? How do, they, how do they get made up? How do we iterate on those elements to make sure the developers can still push forward and release, and we can take a step back, add in a bit more design, and keep incrementing as we go? Um, and this led us to an idea similar to this, but I'm totally just going to use uh, this example, because Brad Frost has it much better than I do. Um, does anybody uh, know who Brad Frost is? Okay, only a few. He is um, a responsive web design guru uh, in uh, works at Pittsburgh, and he coined this idea of uh, developing in what's called atomic design. So breaking your entire pages down all the way down to the atoms. And so you can build up those atoms. It could be a headline, it could be a button, but that button is made up, that button would be a molecule made up of styles and so on. And you build those all the way up to get to your pages. Now, my thought with this, because obviously we came to something fairly similar, but what if we could break down even our pages into the elements, and then those elements even further down into atoms, and we can build those things up and iterate on individual atoms as we go. So I'm just going to talk about the first two options, uh, the atoms and the molecules, mostly molecules. So the molecule is a, is a group of atoms, um, and call it an element, and it functions together as a unit. And that unit could be a table block, a fixture block, a scorecard, a player card. And they could exist anywhere in the system or the website. So, as an example, final piece on the end is our match score. But our match score is made up of the actual score itself, which is um, the scorer, which is a separate element, and then the badges or the teams, whatever we sort of fit. We took that one step further in the design, and uh, PA helpfully started to bring together some of those IDs for each one of those teams. We actually created what's called this core ID as a molecule, and that molecule is made up of a team badge, two different types of name, so the full name and the three letter short name. Um, which, believe me, the three dollar short name comes in extremely handy when you're doing mobile. <laughs> a lot of space. When we did that, and people went, I just, we don't need those. I'm like, trust me now, we use them all the time. Um, helpfully, PA gave us each individual player and all of their stats, and gave us a core color that we can use for uh, possession or whatever else that they can see fit. All of that would bundle into our core ID, and then we could design this helm. So as I said, um, the, we had an existing site, so that was pulling in the existing headline that existed uh, from our old website now. We would actually use JavaScript to um, suck in our new piece of content and replace the headline. And then the first release we put out just had the score, the two teams, and the score. That was really important. The second release we put out any tertiary information we thought was not absolutely necessary for the first release. So which half, any aggregate scores, where it's been implemented. And then finally, any um, type, so uh, at the same time we were constantly doing type and understanding, you know, layouts, we put in the badges, any other sort of styles that we miss. This whole process would take probably a week and a half. Each one of those things we would release in its own, in its own right. And uh, there's a look at the sort of little, the final example. Um, that was in May of this year. And anything that we thought wasn't right, it didn't matter, we could then just come back, because we were doing it in little pieces, and we thought about the development of little pieces. But it's because of the fact that we thought about the design of little pieces as well, we could iterate constantly on an incrementation, if that makes sense. 
Second example. Was our match stats. <coughs> so the option on the left is what the developer said that they could get out first. Take a couple of days, bar charts, really, really straightforward. Myself and the designer took a step away and thought, you know, what do we think is missing from this, uh, these match sets? How can we make them a bit more engaging? Uh, the first design we looked at was just doing goal attempts. We iterated on this a ton of different times and we came up with a nice little goal piece. And then the final iteration we did uh, was looking at possession. So we were just constantly picking different parts of this to see if there's any way we can enhance it or dehance it. Um, I'm not going to show you all the different examples of the goal attempts, but there's probably like 20 or 30. And you'd be surprised that if we put out and <coughs> back. It didn't matter. As long as it told you roughly what was going on. And we would release these individually again a couple of days. You know, this one, I think this one took about a week because that possession donut was an absolute killer. Um, goal attempts, we iterated on a lot because we had like diagonal lines. We were designer was putting in all kinds of stuff, but we were sort of dialing in dialing in check. This is one of the most interesting ones because when we actually went into the research on what we called player cards, we couldn't find any like physical examples of this in the real world. So we couldn't sort of riff on what other people were doing or take examples. So we actually spent a good couple of weeks in design just moving things around, getting a feeling of what we thought was uh, gonna work. And we kept going and going and going. And when we actually sat down with the developers, and we took stock, the developers would go, look, guys, this is basically broken into three things. There's an image, which we're not going to do right now, because A, it's really hard to get an image in, and B, most of the images are shared. So you're going to have to source your own. Okay? We're going to play a name and a bit of tertiary information on what position they're in. And then we just have stats. So we want you guys to go away and think about what the top four stats are you want to put on the page. We can get the name and the position, that's fine. So if you just ignore that bottom image, that was the first release we put out, right? Looks pretty basic, looks pretty rubbish. Um, after about a week of a lot of pain, we finally found some decent images of uh, all of the jury. You think it'd be over there? It's not. And uh, this is the final example. So this is the first week of the Premier League this year. So this is like 15 months after we finished working on the football project at all. And it's great to see in the very first post, this is one of our top 10 things to learn about the weekend. This is one of the very first um, posts we put out, and it had player cards in it straight away. The editorial team loved having the control about where they wanted to put data. They loved it. Again, so we, we ran with that, and we started looking at, hey, what if we could put in your team, and they could uh, mention Everton in here, and then drop in Everton exactly where, where Everton are exactly in the league. And then you can start to see you know, the similarities between the player card style and the, the league style and the fixture style. And everything starts to sort of get this sort of common language and style. But it comes iteratively. We don't just go pick this perfect language at the beginning and then go with it. So we had some clear design goals. You know, it's pretty obvious, really, when you think about it. We're going to have scores, we're going to have stats, we're going to have all this stuff. But it was clear from the start to get a sort of get our design names and merge them into what our development process was going to be. And see if we could cut it down to these atoms, build up molecules, and start to design in an agile way. So our designs weren't set in stone, so we could make a mess, but really quickly. Okay, finally, I'm going to talk about teamwork. So obviously team, you know, teamwork comes from also team, um, but I think there's, there's a lot of internal and external perspectives on what that awesome team actually does. Externally, really they, they want speed and momentum, they want to see results coming out. Internally, we want to own our work, we want to feel like our opinions matter. We want to feel like everyone's playing along. And we really don't want to feel like there's a team superstar. Can't really, I think the team of six, having a superstar would be really obvious. So this is the you know the small agile team of men. <laughs> uh, there were uh, two developers, one back end, one front end, uh, QA, uh, PM, and two designers, one visual and one like me, interaction, UX, whatever. 
We also then had a project manager to help steer get the wheels of this at the beginning. And uh, a researcher to come in and help us talk to people who really didn't test it. Because there was only six of us, and we were co-located, and sorry, crucially we were co-located, we literally sat around a very cramped desk, which actually only held four people, but we managed to squeeze five on, because we thought it was important to make it really uncomfortable for six months. <laughs> Three months, whatever. Um, I'm aware of the fact that our PM was sat upside down, what it looks like, and uh, the wrong way around. Uh, that wasn't intentional, it was just the way that it was set up, unfortunately. Um, so this, for all intents and purposes, was a meeting. Meetings would potentially have a piece of an agenda. They might be individuals. They might just be, oh hey, can you check out things for me? Oh hey, there's a bug there. I've got this new piece of design. Can you just check out the other tweak? Um, I'm going to go into Git. I'm going to pull out that pull request and just make sure the design looks quite right. You could just turn one way or the other. It wasn't really we were being too precious. If we did need to have a meeting, we had a whiteboard right next to the desk. Um, a lot of discussions um, would start off with myself and the visual designer. We would stand up on a whiteboard and we would discuss like, uh, the problems with the visual design. So this is an example of the knockout stages of the World Cup from last year. And we were discussing how the hell we got all of that information onto mobile without losing our minds and people being able to find their way. So generally, we start with uh, just writing everything up on the whiteboard. Then we normally get our project manager involved. Uh, product manager involved, sorry. Um, we pull it off the whiteboard and go, does this make sense? Do you think we should get everyone else involved, or should we go back to the drawing board and do that again? And lose a really good sounding board before grabbing the developers from the desks, essentially wasting their time. And we would work up this sort of mini logic board, um, possibly in Google Docs. I think this is an illustrator. And down the left-hand side is the preference that we have from our users. And down the right-hand side is literally the content that we can provide. So if they're looking for the right knockout piece, what can we provide? You know, what kind of techniques can we do in design? Is that, you know, can we use accordions and so on? And then finally, we get everyone either around the whiteboard or we pull up a laptop, gather everyone together and just go, here's what we're thinking. Do you think this makes sense? Yes or no? And that would be normally a bit more of a spec document. This would probably take a couple of hours. Um, and then we would share that with the development team. And then we'd either go in and design those structured pieces, and then we would come back in as design and have to tweak them up to a point where they're ready to go out. That whole process would be done in a couple of hours. Go. OK, so at some point, we have to get the scary stakeholders involved, right? We, you know, it would feel like it was really scary, apart from the fact that because we were involving them so, so constantly, and whenever they were walking past, just nonchalantly, really not that nonchalantly, looking at the boards of our designs, looking at our um, camera board, they could see what was going on. They were constantly kept in the loop. We set up uh, regular meetings on Wednesday, just for 20 minutes for them to come up, see where we were, show the releases. Because we were releasing every other day, you could see the um, progression that we were going through and how we were making stuff better. And that's not, you know, the kind of corners here. They know way more about football than we do, so we have to respect them in that respect. But they do have opinions about everything else. So sort of tuning into the right channel, making sure that we know, they know what's important to us and we know what's important to them, and getting the right sort of expertise out of them. Like I said, it's really scary for stakeholders. So they would see any number of these things. So from we would either bring them up to the whiteboards, they would see the full spec documents, they might see the full design, or they might even just come along and look at the boards with all of you know sketch and the designs. They just see the whole lot. We didn't care about keeping anything precious. It wasn't like oh, we should be stakeholders ready to see it. We just started because we kept them interested and involved right from the beginning. It didn't matter if it wasn't out or it was going to go out next week because they knew they weren't so fucked. So I'm just going to reiterate that. So communication is constant, and we pick people off. You know, we pick things off when we needed to. And if we needed someone to go and have a quick chat to, you, it was just turn around and talk. Um, we were really open and honest about everything with each other. Um, so 
one of the things, I quickly did this up a couple weeks ago because we were talking to uh, Marty Kagan, the Silicon Valley, Valley uh, product group, and he talked about this concept of dual track. And so you always have a separate team doing discovery that feeds into the main track. But we didn't have another main track. So in, that, in reality, we had this big discovery piece at the beginning, and then between each launch, we have little mini discoveries. So it would be like, what did we learn? Did the design go the right way? Did it not? Why not? Let's do another release. Let's find out. And so the lines are really blurred between who did what. Because there was only six of us. You can't have that kind of mentality of, that's not my job. I can't, I can't do that piece. I don't know how to use Git. Didn't matter. If you didn't know how to use Git, you learned how to use Git. So you could put in proper bug requests. We didn't have enough people to just do one QA. We were releasing that much. So everyone did their bit. For example, this is a spreadsheet with every single three-letter acronym for every single team in Europe. Every single team. And we were pulling together every ID for that team so the developers could find the team really quickly and really easily. Then we sourced every badge for every single one of those teams. This took about four days and three people's time. But if we hadn't done this, we wouldn't have then been able to say, show a random Champions League qualifier between uh, and it was Dnipro and someone else. And Dnipro lost, and they went down, but they went all the way to the Europa League final. And that was on the front page of the Guardian a year later. And because we sourced the right badge, it didn't look shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you do, you, you do the dog work to make sure that it's going to work. You have no idea. That's what I'm talking about, the unpredictability. You have no idea if Nipper is suddenly going to be one of the next superstars of Europe. And we're going to look idiots because we don't have the team color, so the uh, possession of shit. We're not going to have the right name or spell wrong or a three-letter acronym or a badge. It seems all simple, but you just cover the bases. So to recap on the teamwork, we had no official meetings. It was all around the desk. If there was nowhere else to go, we just discussed right there. Um, we had this shared understanding of language around football, so everybody knew what you know a free kick was, the offside rule, <laughs> and um, there was no bullshit. It was a surprising lack of egos. If something didn't work, we just said so. We had no time to be precious. We had to make sure that we were moving on to the next thing and improving stuff constantly. So I'm way out of time. Uh, I'll just speed through this bit. Um, so our uh, main measurement was um, time on page, and once we, the very first release when we put uh, match stats on the page, our time on page went down by half. And at first that seemed really scary, because you want people to stay on page, but we brought people in and we talked to them, we kept it iterating, and what we actually learned from people was that, oh, because you're showing all the stats, I don't have to go looking for them, I'm actually just going to get one of What's most important is I'm going to come back. So <coughs> just quickly, I'm going to say that measuring stuff in a newspaper is really hard because you just don't know what the right thing is going to be. You don't know if that match is going to be a 4-0 thriller or a 0-0 no goal fest. That's the same with news, the same with so much. You don't know if your feature is going to make that impact, but sometimes if you just constantly talk and you don't know how to go to So this kind of small team mentality has sort of been taken into other teams. And uh, you know, there's rough goal in mind, focus team to develop. Uh, the apps team do this often around hack weeks, uh, monetization, speed, and so on. And uh, one example of the design spike was um, the apps team did Cricket. So they took four or five people, they took the data from PA, and they talked to the team downstairs. They got all the goals they wanted in mind. They got that shared understanding, and they produced some really awesome stuff in about a month and a half. Uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, obviously, what I imagine one of the things you're thinking is, yeah, that sounds great, you're doing a lot of stuff, but you obviously must have broken an absolute ton. Uh, this is the full Premier League table being injected into an article page. This is supposed to be not that far. Uh, this is the uh, match stats, when we thought they were so important that they should probably overtake some of the content. Uh, this was a nice accident. There's never going to be a 7 0 thriller, right? Not in the semi final of a World Cup, right? Yeah. What happens in women's football? There's a lot of big scores, right? Oh, we'll be okay. We won't. No one will win like 10 0 or 10 1, right? 
all content disappears, and just go crazy. So in summary, we started with a shared understanding. We integrated our design into development. With lots of close working. We were co-located. We were focused. We were awesome. Thank you.